let's move on to the last uh, speaker of this session. By the way, I think I've not introduced myself. So <laughs> at the beginning, so my name is Aki Minoda from Riken, Yokohama in Japan, uh, same center as Piero. Um, so yeah, Jessica uh, is an associate professor um, and a group leader at the University of Queensland. Uh, she leads a computational biology group that investigates how variability in the genome contributes to the regulation of diseases like cancer or phenotypes like pluripotency in stem cells. She received her PhD in biostatistics from Harvard University uh, and followed by a postdoc training at Dana Farber Cancer, Inst Cancer Institute. Uh, and then she became an assistant professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And she has actually recently um, moved back to Australia. Um, and uh, she has been working on like the aging process using single cell bioinformatics and understanding cancer genomics through novel statistical methods. Thank you so much, Jessica. And her title is Aging, Heterogeneity and Single Cells. Thank you so much, Aki and Guanghui, for the kind invitation. Um, it's been really great to, to be part of this Human Cell Atlas meeting um, and my heart wishes we were in China today um, but nevertheless it's it's just been so wonderful to to be part of these talks and hear about all this really exciting work in in aging so um, as Aki mentioned the the title of my talk is is really about the work that we've been doing in single cells and in the aging research space um, my research group here at the University of Queensland is focused on computational biology and bioinformatics and really the, the core focus that, that I'm interested in is understanding heterogeneity in distributions of data. And so I'm sure we're all familiar in, um, about looking at data, right? Um, and, and really um, in our, our group, what we've done is found a lot of more information by looking at other features of this distribution. So typically we focus on the mean or the median in bioinformatics and we look for differences in this, in this statistic as it changes. Um, but what's really interesting I think is going beyond this and looking at what we call in statistics these moment estimators which give us more information because we're starting to look at things like the width of this distribution like the variance. Um, also we can start to look at things like skewness or kurtosis. Um, and as we think about different features of this distribution, other things like bimodality or multimodality are also important too. And this helps us understand the extreme values or the outliers that are occurring. And we all know that the most interesting biology is happening at the extremes. So in terms of aging, uh, the way we're applying this uh, investigation into heterogeneity is really to understand you know, what is going on as humans age uh, during their lifetime. And I think a, a heterogeneity is a really interesting angle because we all know that aging obviously is a very subtle phenotype that takes a long time to accumulate. Um, there's also a lot of heterogeneity between different tissue types, between different donors, um, like Pierre's example of these supercentenarians. It's certainly not one box fits all with, with um, our human population. So what I'm gonna to do today is describe some of the different projects that we have in the group. Um, these are very much still works in progress. So um, it's, it's more to, to introduce you to the kind of diversity of work that we do in my group. Um, so first of all, I'll go ahead and, and talk about um, a project that we're working on with uh, Professor Nia Barsali uh, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And this is looking at the drug metformin. So Guanghui mentioned this um, in, in his work, in his first talk. Um, and metformin is a really interesting drug, especially for anti-aging. It is a, a drug that's been approved by the FDA um, for type, di type two diabetes. Um, and it's been shown to extend lifespan in some model organisms. Um, but in vivo, we actually don't really know the mechanisms of metformin. Um, there are tissue specific effects, um, but in terms of the pathways that relate to aging and how that is all activated, um, it's still really unclear what those details are. So working with Nir, um, we uh, were fortunate to co-supervise a really talented PhD student who is now Dr. Amaya Kokani. Um, and what we did was we took 12 mice, so four replicates in each of these groups. We took young mice, old mice, and old mice that had been treated with metformin. Um, and we extracted two different tissues from, from the same mouse. Um, this was fat and muscle. 
and we applied uh, 10x uh, single cell RNA sequencing to generate uh, some data for, for this data set. And we were really lucky to have uh, funding from a few different sources um, really to, to generate a, a sizable data set. And so really, um, as we all know, single cell RNA-seq data takes a lot of pre-processing and a lot of steps. Uh, and this is the pipeline that we've used in the group to analyze this data. Um, but essentially what I wanted to show you for now at least is uh, the kind of cell clusters that we've got. So this is adipose. Um, these are the, the cell clusters we've got for the different mice. Um, we've used single R and leveraged data coming from the Ingen project. Um, and although we've got adipose, um, I just want to clarify that what we're looking at really is the stromal vascular fraction. So just uh, adipocytes are really fascinating cells, but they're also really large and not really likely to fit through the 10x uh, machine. So this also explains why we see so much representation, I think, from the immunological cell type. So we do see a large component of adipose derived stem cells, but also these macrophages, B cells, uh, et cetera. And I think the thing that's really fascinating when we got this data back is that you'll notice on this side where we've highlighted the old cells, the young cells, and also the metformin treated cells, you don't see this glaringly obvious cluster of cells that are purely because of the aging effect or purely because of the metformin effect. And I think this adds to our understanding that aging really is um, this much more subtle kind of phenotype. Um, and so extracting and understanding the changes that we see is, is obviously a far more challenging task. What is kind of cool to see though, is this uh, small group here in the middle, which does seem to be more, uh, more geared towards the metformin treated group. And this overlaps um, quite strongly, you'll see with the B cell group here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. When we look at the muscle cells, um, again, we see sort of similar, similar types of, of uh, cell type groups that we see. Um, so here we've got the endothelials, the B cells, the T cells, um, macrophages up here. Um, again, the kind of subtlety of this aging phenotype um, and the lack of just strong uh, sort of effects due to one of these treatments is, is pretty clear. We do see up here though, um, that there is a small, again, small metformin cluster that seems to overlap with the B cells. And I know you can't see it because all the text is jumbled up together, um, but there are T cells there as well. So we're really uh, from, a, from a biological, from a immune perspective, from a drug perspective, we um, are figuring you know, what out what's going on. Um, but what I wanted to highlight is the fact that we're using this data to actually study a relatively novel kind of bioinformatic question. And this is really to understand what is the prevalence of different kinds of statistical distributions in the single cell gene expression data. So specifically, we're interested in looking at whether genes in this data set look more like a negative binomial, excuse me, a negative binomial here, Poisson, um, or these zero inflated distributions, which represent um, a, a specific distribution that captures the overabundance of zeros. We think that this might be a really interesting way to model aging, um, especially if we see sort of changes between one distribution to another, um, because I think that might be a good way to capture the subtlety of, of the aging phenotype that we're seeing. So this project is being led by um, a really great PhD student, Melindry, who has uh, started to, to make some real headway into, into this question. And for instance, with single cell data, we often use a negative binomial distribution to capture uh, the features of the expression profile. And for this data, you can see that overall, the negative binomial really does capture uh, the majority of um, the genes that, that we're seeing. Nevertheless, we, we do see representation for these other distributions. So for instance, the Poisson um, and also these zero inflated counterparts that I mentioned. So it's interesting, these are uh, somewhat variable between the adipose and the muscle tissue. But I think what this is interesting next is to ask what are the changes between these different groups, between old and young, between treated and old. Um, and perhaps this is a way then to really understand what is performance drug action. So uh, what she's done is to set up a, a statistical framework that allows us to really quantify, first of all, which is the most appropriate 
uh, distribution that fits uh, the single slow gene expression profile. Um, and she's done this uh, using uh, various different kinds of stats based predominantly on the BIC, Bayesian information criteria. And from that, we can assign, you know, one of these four distributions. Um, what we're seeing too then is the change between say one of these distributions into another distribution type. And this is a different way of looking at changes in gene expression. Um, and I, again, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's an interesting way to get at those regulatory changes uh, that are occurring um, between the different conditions. So I just want to show you uh, this slide because I think it's, it captures some of the ways that we can use this information to understand the effect of metformin and also the effect of aging. And there's a lot to unpack here, but if you just focus on this, this graph, um, what we're looking at here is the comparison between the old data and the young data for adipose. Um, and what Melindry's identified with her pipeline is the subset of genes that are differentially distributed, meaning there is a significant change going from old versus young in adipose. And what we've done is broken these down into their representation for the different cell types. And so if you look, we can assess whether that overlap in differentially distributed genes is statistically significant. And the only comparison here is the overlap between T cells and B cells. And what's interesting is when we look at the other kinds of comparisons here between older metformin, for instance, in adipose, we again see this comparison as being the only significant one. Um, when we look at muscle, we see similar sorts of trends. Um, instead, we've got regulatory T cells now overlapping with B cells. And so we're, we're still teasing apart this result to understand what this all means. Um, but it certainly is interesting to see that flip um, from, from these different distributions. So um, in the last, I think, five minutes, I want to talk about the other project that we have in the group. And this is to take a step back from looking at whole organisms to looking at mice. Um, and it's instead moved to a mesenchymal stem cell model. So here we're using a cell culture experiment to mimic human aging. So um, certainly is aging, um, but nevertheless, I think it affords some interesting opportunities where we can really start to look at the engagement of heterogeneity, how it occurs in different pathways um, in these cells. And so we're collaborating with Professor Ernst Wolfertang, who's at UQ, and also with Hilda Pickett, who's in Sydney. She's a telomere biology expert. Um, and what we've got here is we, we've got a time course um, where we're following mesenchymal stem cells um, through different passages. So we've got an early, middle, and a late phase. Um, and here we're interested in the onset of senescence. So um, what we've done is we've uh, looked at beta-galactosidase, which is a really common marker for cellular senescence. And you can see as we transition through these stages, we start at not very much senescence to basically over 80% of cells are senescent in that final time point. We've extracted single cell RNA-seq from each of these time points. And um, we're also looking at some um, telomere counts from, uh, from Hilda's lab, to, but I won't be talking about that today. And um, we've got the single cell sequencing data for these nine samples. Um, and it's interesting. So uh, you can definitely see a passage time effect. So basically, as these cells become more senescent, going from early, um, middle to late, um, we do see these sorts of clouds that are distinct to those regions. Um, for the replicates, we're hard to see that there is a, isn't a replicate specific effect, which is super awesome. Um, and in terms of cell cycle phase, uh, these are kind of uh, fairly equally distributed between the three sections, which was a little bit of a surprise. Um, what we want to do with this data is really understand how cells are changing in terms of their gene expression profiles as they become more senescent, and also the contribution of heterogeneity in um, changing the single cells as, as they age um, in this model. So um, this is being led by my postdoc, um, who is really great, um, Dr. Ati Tahiri Fad. And what Ati's done is she's uh, clustered these cells. So, and through a lot of hard work, been able to figure out what some of these clusters might be doing or contributing. You can see in terms of the breakdown um, for these different clusters, that there are some that are predominantly one time point versus another. Um, and then there's some others that are, are really quite mixed. So um, you can see that's pretty cool because we are focusing on senescence. We really do want to understand what is going on in that later stage senescent phenotype. So looking at this plot um, in, in terms of looking at this UMAP, 
uh, what she's identified as cluster zero here is uh, largely a pre senescent state. Um, and then we have the contributions from a SASP induced senescent signature. Um, we've also got some cells that are escaping from this particular kind of senescence. And then curiously, we see an onco induced senescent phenotype, which is quite interesting. Um, this talk, uh, this part of the section would go on for a lot longer than we have available, um, but it's certainly getting us closer to understanding, you know, what are the cell states involved in terms of senescent phenotype? Um, how do they contribute to aging? And hopefully we uh, would like to identify perhaps some new markers or new pathways that are associated with being engaged in, in this onset of senescence. So in the last few minutes, um, I just want to talk briefly about a different direction we're also taking. So using the same time course model and the same experimental design, um, going through the early, middle, late stages, um, what we're also doing is capturing images. And the idea here is to capture enough images of different kinds of features that we can develop predictive models of cellular senescence in these MSCs. And what we're doing is working with um, Ernst Wolvertang, uh, accessing his operetta, which is a super powerful microscope. Um, and this project is being led by Ebony Watson, who's a fantastic PhD student in my group. And we're trying to capture these different markers. So for instance, beta gal, um, like I mentioned, but also um, other markers that are associated with understanding senescence. So these are things like cell cycle arrest, P21, P16, um, also mitochondrial dysfunction through using Senes Red, um, and then other sorts of things where we can understand the cells themselves. So looking at actin and also uh, DAPI staining. So as you might already know, there are lots of different ways to identify what a senescent cell looks like. And while some of these are molecular, looking at cell cycle arrest genes or DNA damage or um, like beta-gal, there's also others that relate to perhaps the shape of the cell or the biomass um, or other features. And uh, you can see that they all are quite different in the senescent and control states. And so what we're trying to do is set up this computational pipeline. Ebony's got many of these steps going already where we can pull out these different kinds of information um, to understand how the onset of senescence is changing in these MSCs. And the overall goal is really to put this information all together to develop a predictive model that's based on these images that we're pulling um, and to use this to determine which cells are senescent and not senescent and characterize the features of this process. We're hoping to be able to apply this and perhaps generalize it out to other different tissues. Um, and also to be able to get a better understanding perhaps of the hierarchy or the contributions of these different markers. Um, some of them may really just be redundant um, and, uh, or, or you know, uh, compensating for each other. So I will end my talk uh, there by acknowledging uh, my amazing group. I hope this talk gives you a, a, an insight into the kind of work that we've been doing. Um, it's certainly been distributed amongst lots of different amazing people. Um, and uh, also like to acknowledge the funding uh, bodies who have given us money so we can do all these uh, incredible things. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for a great talk, Jessica. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in in the Q&A box. Uh, yeah, from Louis Tien. Uh, differential distribution can be a result of multiple factors, such as sequencing depth, more zero at low depth, or more heterogeneity in the population. Uh, two cell types where the gene is downregulated in one cell type create a bimodal distribution. How do you account for them? Yeah, so that's a great question, Louis. Um, so a few different ways. Um, I mean, in terms of sequencing depth, the, the data is normalized, I believe, before this goes into the pipeline. So we do try to sequence, uh, excuse me, try to account for libraries that are more sequenced more deeply than others. Um, in terms of the heterogeneity in the population with different cell types, we do look at differential distributions in, in the um, in all the data, but we've also looked at it, for instance, um, in, in terms of different cell types. So I know that's really horribly small, um, but if we uh, zoom in a bit, so we, we do try to look at within a single cell type, what is the distribution and how is it changing? Um, and actually, in, in fact, what Melintree's found is that 
a lot of the um, the diversity that we see in distributions is is attributed to cell types. So once you account for cell types, um, that number goes down. So I think it certainly is the driver. Um, like you said, um, it is a factor for what we see in the different distributions. We have another question from Callum. Oh, right. so huh? from Callum. Um, so are the switches in gene, uh, gene expression distribution for genes identified consistent across multiple technologies? That's a fantastic question, Callum. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to investigate that. Um, I think it would be a really interesting question. We've, we've looked at um, certainly this 10x data, and um, I'm not sure if Melinda is joining us, but she started to look at the prevalence, especially in terms of those different percentages that we saw. Um, we've started to look at those in the context of other published studies, um, but I'm not sure if those span or, or really have, we've, we've intentionally looked at different technologies. That would certainly be a really good test, a really good, um, a really good study to understand uh, if there are, you know, with those sequencing technologies, different proportions of these distributions. So that's something we'll keep in mind moving forward. So thank you. Kwangfei, maybe do you want to ask the question directly? Yeah. Hi. Great talk, Jessica. Uh, so you. you will talk about the lysosome components for determining uh, the the chemo stem cell synthesis. So what kind of marker that mean? <laughs> oh, for lysosomes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am, I don't think we're looking at that directly. So I think that was really just an example to highlight how uh, senescent cells can be different. Um, but I think from memory, we don't have a specific marker. We're a bit constrained like with our uh, imaging study in, in terms of how many channels we can distribute across, oops, across these, uh, these different um, kinds of uh, markers. So we've kind of have to really prioritize which ones we wanted to study, we wanted to look at more, but um, yeah, we're sort of limited in that way, but certainly would be interesting to study the lysosomal aspect more. That's a shame. I was also going to ask about the imaging, like, do you have, <laughs> uh, can you image like the nuclear architecture, like the, you know, yeah, heterochromatin, nuclear membrane, nuclear olus, you know, that, those are the kind of things I'm also interested in looking at yeah. manually, yeah. No, absolutely. And in fact, um, this this plate got stalled because of COVID. Um, it affected some of the availability of people going into the lab. So I think we've got three quarters of these markers um, for, for the MSC uh, study, but we still have to go back and do a few more. And in that time since, there's actually been, uh, because of the work that Ati has been doing, there's been actually so many other um, IFs we want to do. And so we sort of have to Almost make that call of finishing this plate as is and then you know making a new one to do other things so yeah it's, it's certainly a lot of interesting things to look at okay one quick question i don't okay. know how quick but uh last question so from tommy tarotea uh can these differences in distribution be associated with gene isoform changes and therefore maybe three prime uh data will be limiting instead of smart sig 2 i.e full length yeah no that's a great that's a great question tommy um it Possibly, you know, um, when we look at, uh, certainly when we look at gene expression variability, it's it's a bit of a different sort of metric. But if we look at genes that are like wide, more widely distributed versus more tightly distributed in bulk data, bulk RNA-seq data, um, I think there is certainly transcript variability there. So isoforms, link RNAs, non-coding RNAs, that sort of thing. Um, and so, no, I, I think the point is, is well taken. If we were to look at SmartSeq data, I think we probably... Um, may be able to access some of that diversity and understand how those genes or those uh, transcripts are showing up in terms of different distributions. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't been able to, to access SmartSeq data, but that's certainly a, a good place to look next. Okay, thank you so much.